So you may not know this, but Ben and Jerry's ice cream has 54 different flavors. That's a lot of ice cream. And there's a lot of ice cream beyond Ben and Jerry's. I grew up driving past Baskin Robbins, which had 31 flavors. It may not always have had 31 flavors. But just if you put them together, that's a lot of ice cream. That's a lot of flavors of ice cream. And everybody has their favorites, right? If you're with us in the chat, you can, you can say in the chat what your favorite kind of ice cream is. Personally, I like half-baked. It's a really good flavor of ice cream that combines like almost done brownies and chocolate chip cookie dough mixed together with ice creamy goodness. And, but there are some flavors that I just can't stand. Uh, there's, there's a coconut one that Ben and Jerry's makes that just makes me squirm. And then there's a pistachio one. Like For those of you who love that pistachio pudding that some people make, no thank you. Not, not an ice cream for me. Each flavor appeals to different people, and, each, and some of those flavors just aren't right for us. They just, they aren't. And yet, no matter what, ice cream appeals to a wide variety of people. And every single kind of ice cream, including the coconut and the pistachio or the half-baked, has three main ingredients that all ice cream has. You ready? Frozen water, concentrated cream, and air. Mix it all up really well, and then you add all the other stuff in. But those three things are consistent across all ice cream. Otherwise, it can't be called ice cream. It can be called all sorts of other things. Yogurt, custard. No, I won't go in that long list. But the reality is, is that at its base level, ice cream shares the essential things. And then everything else that's added on top of it is flavoring or consistency or something else that shapes it into what that particular expression of ice cream is. And Ben and Jerry says 54 of those. You can try them all. I don't recommend it. And when we gather together and we say the Nicene Creed, we're recognizing that there are lots of things that churches and Christians believe, but these are the things that we hold together. The three essential ingredients, if you will. Beliefs that are universal across all churches and should be across all Christians. And in the Nicene Creed, we say, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Oh, hey, there it is. We believe, you can join with me in this. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. See, our tech people were more prepared than I was for this part. It's amazing. This is what we say at the end of the Nicene Creed. We can agree on these things. Our universal church can agree on these things. And in that are those categories about what it means to be church. And one of those things really breaks my heart. In fact, it kind of makes me angry. And it's the one thing Jesus prayed for. That they would be one. And I understand why John captures this prayer in his telling of Jesus, of the story of Jesus' life that we call a gospel. John had been with Jesus. He'd been traveling with Jesus. And he knew how the disciples were. He knew how he was. And he understood how everybody who would believe based upon what the disciples said would be. Because we're all human. He'd been with Jesus when the disciples asked Hey, those places that are mean to us, can we call down fire on them? And James and John became the sons of thunder, according to the other disciples. And I think they teased them with that name. And G John was around when he and the other disciples tried to keep the kids away because Jesus' robes were nice and clean and he didn't want to get them dirty when the grubby little hands got all over them. And J John was traveling with Jesus 
when the disciples got into an argument about who was most important or greatest among them. You see, the disciples didn't agree. And we don't always do that either. All you have to do is look around any community and see just how many different churches there are. And oftentimes we treat churches in the same way we treat them as ice cream flavors. If we don't like one, we move on and go to the next. Or if the, this batch of the ice cream doesn't taste the way we expected it to, we move on. And we go find another. And that's harmful to community. That's harmful to, to creating the family that God has called us to be, to be the church. That when we decide, oh, we don't like this, we're going to move on and go to another one. And yet, on the other hand, that may also be a strength of the church. It may be one of the aspects of the redemptive work of the Holy Spirit in the church, creating so many different types of church, of people gathering together to worship God, so that all people might find a place among them. Now, I really don't know whether it's good or bad to have that many churches. I can see both sides of that coin. But I can say with all honesty, we are not one. And this is why I think John includes this in Jesus' prayer, why he captures this. He may have overheard Jesus saying it and said, i got to write this down because I need this. I need to hear this. I need to read this. I need to know this. Jesus prays, that we would be one. That his disciples, his children, would be able to get along after he left them. That those who believe based upon their testimony would experience the love and community and grace that is what the church is. And so when we say this word one, I have to say I believe it's an, an aspirational goal. It's something that we believe can be, but is not yet. There are glimpses of it. And I sat in churches for years, well, as a child. I grew up going to the church. I don't remember a time not being in church, thanks be to my grandmother. But I didn't understand what it was to be church until I got into a youth group. I was a misfit kid who never got accepted anywhere except in the church where everybody was a misfit. Our youth group was the island of misfit toys, and we were all welcome there. And in that, I discovered what it means to be a part of a community that will be with each other through thick and through thin, who will love each other no matter what. And friends, that's church. People gathered together together to explore their faith, to love each other even when it's hard, to journey with each other even when it's hard. To be one when everything else says to be separate. And I love that youth group. 25 years later, we still are in touch with one another. We still talk. A month or so ago, one of our people from the youth group was in Orlando, and the two of us who live in Florida drove to meet, and the three of us sat down and talked like it was yesterday that we had seen each other. It's beautiful to have that kind of a fellowship. And that's what church can be when we get into it and struggle together and stay in love with God But that's not all, is it? We say one, and oneness is good, but oneness can happen in all sorts of things. If it, the offensive line of a football team does their job, they act as one, and they are not a church. They could be. I don't know what they do outside of the football game, but they could be a church. I don't think they are when they're on the football field, though. Because you can be one and united in something and love each other and care about each other without being a church. The other qualifiers are holy, Catholic, and apostolic. 
which we have a lot of baggage with those words, though, don't we? So maybe it's, I need to unpack them for us for a second. It me, holiness, what it is to be holy as a group of people. The concept of holiness we often get wrong because in our society we think it means perfect or clean or pure. It doesn't. To be holy is to be set apart for God. To recognize that we are, we are, A-R-E, gods. We belong to God. That's what it means to be holy. It's identifying who we belong to, not because we're perfect, but because God is, and God has created us and loved us and welcomed us as his. To be the church that is holy is to recognize that we belong to God. First and foremost, the building doesn't belong to us. Our community, our fellowship doesn't belong to us. We are defined by our relationship with God. Our identity is rooted in Christ, who prayed for us that we would be united together in the same way that he was united with God, the Father. This next word, Catholic, it, it, it gets tossed around a lot because it's been around for over a thousand years. It's a Greek word that isn't, you won't find anywhere in the Greek New Testament. You won't find it anywhere in the Bible. But it was in philosophy. And where you'll find it, you'll find that it means general or universal. Like those universal tools you have that you can change out the sockets for, that's a Catholic set of tools. Not Roman Catholicism, that's something completely different, but Catholic as a word means universal. And when I read that word, and when I see that as a def- defining marker of the church, when I proclaim that in the Nicene Creed or in the Apostles' Creed, I'm saying that the church is for everyone. Everywhere. In every time. Because the church belongs to God, that's the holy part, We don't get to decide who is in and who is out. The church is a a community of people who is open and invitational to everyone, whether they be priest or prostitute, tax collector, Jew, Gentile, LGBTQ, straight, cisgender, transgender, everybody is welcome in the universal experience of God's presence that is the church. And as the church, we are also apostolic. We are apostles. And that's the Greek word for sent. And it's not sent like a package or a letter. It's sent more in the sense of a diplomat where we are sent with the authority and the very real presence of the one who has sent us. We, the church, are the incarnation, the body of Christ, sent into the world that everyone might experience Jesus through us. This is the hallmark of the church. The reason we exist is to be sent to go and bear the image of God wherever we go. One holy Catholic and apostolic church. I can believe in this, not only because I know that it's possible, because I experienced it in a youth group, and you may have experienced it in a Sunday school class, or with a group of people that you've been praying with, or maybe here in the worship service, or online in a community of people that you relate to every day. I know it's real and I believe in it. And every time we practice church, every time we get to be the body of Christ, the believers, we get to practice this. And in the Methodist church, once a month, we get to practice this unity aspect through the celebration of communion. We get to celebrate the Eucharist, which is Greek for Thanksgiving. 
So for those of you who think Thanksgiving's only in November, that's an American holiday. We Christians celebrate Thanksgiving at least once a month in the Methodist church. We gather around a table, sort of. It's back there. We break bread, and we remember Jesus, the one who taught us what it is to love and serve, the one who prayed that we would be one as he was one with the Father, the one who, even when his disciples didn't get it, he loved them anyway. We practice this meal, and when we do, we we ask for God to forgive us. Because we've failed to be an obedient church. We have failed to be one. We have failed to recognize that we are gods. We have failed to recognize the universality or the generality of the church. And we have failed to be the bearers of God's image into places where people need to experience God's presence. And so when we confess that part of the liturgy, Make that your confession. And confess knowing that that you are forgiven and God is not done with us yet. That one day we can live into that aspirational belief of one holy Catholic and apostolic church united in baptism. I want to leave you with this quote before I transition back to our communion. This is a quote from John Wesley when he was 87 years old. He wrote a letter to his friend Alexander. And these are his words. Give me 100 preachers who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And I care not a straw whether they be clergymen or laymen. Such alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven on earth. Brothers and sisters, we can be those 100 folks who fear nothing but God and desire, or who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. I should keep that right in front of me. And when we do, God can do amazing things through us as a church that we couldn't possibly imagine for ourselves. Just 100 folks. We're already more than that between those of you online and those of you who are here. What would it look like for us to live into that? 